There are so many things to love about Christmas. The gifts, the traditions, the time with family. But we all know the most important thing about Christmas is celebrating the birth of Jesus and what he means to the world. But what if Christmas is more than a manger, wise men, and angels? What if there's more to unwrap about the birth of Jesus? I believe there is. The Christmas story is a lot bigger and a whole lot more amazing than we might think. Let's stand in awe at the wonder of it all. The wonder of it all conceived by the Spirit. We've looked at the humanity of Jesus next week. Hopefully we'll be able to put a capstone on this series, Wonder of It All. This morning we're looking at Jesus being conceived by the Spirit and the ramifications, what that means for us as followers today. I'm going to read out of Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1 in just a moment. But before I do, let me just suggest this to you. I think that oftentimes as believers, especially those of us in this room, we hear about Jesus being conceived of the Holy Spirit. We hear about the virgin birth, and it may cause us to yawn a little bit. And we may think because of our familiarity with it, we're just going to clock out. And, 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 and I hope this morning that we would be able to realize the significance, the real impact, the, the, the whole beauty of the truth that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and that the truth of the virgin birth, even though we may know it well, may still be a treasured truth in our heart. And that's the focus of this morning's message, the, the, the conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So would you with me uh, look in Matthew chapter 1, verse, I'm going to read verses 18 through 25, and then we'll jump over to the gospel of Luke chapter 1. Both of these accounts, Matthew and Luke, are the accounts of the announcement of the birth of Jesus to Mary and then or to Joseph and then to Mary. We'll read Joseph's account first and then Mary's in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 1, Matthew verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took his wife. But he did not know her until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38 In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and is in the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. 
And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit is a mystery. We don't really understand how it all happened, but we know that it did. You see, when, when Luke gives this account, as he had investigated the story of Jesus and done the research, and, and no doubt, uh, much of the information that we have in Luke's gospel could have only come from Mary herself. And Luke is recounting this story, and the Bible tells us, the angel tells us what is going to happen, that the, Lord, the power of the Lord will overcome you, and will, the, the, the Lord will overshadow you. So what we know is that Joseph had nothing to do with bringing Jesus into the world. I want you to think for just a moment why this is so important, because Jesus, no doubt, was a miraculous birth. And without question, there were other miraculous births in the Scriptures. I mean, I think of Isaac, who was the, 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 the promised son of Abraham and Sarah. And, and they had Isaac miraculously at, at, at a tremendously old age when there was no way they should have physically been able to have this son Isaac. But they did. It was a miraculous birth. And even in our account this morning, we, we hear of Elizabeth and Zechariah who were able, even in their advanced age, able to have a son that they would name John the Baptist that would be the forerunner for Jesus. So without question, we find in Scripture these moments where there were miraculous births, but there were no births like this one. There never has been a birth like this one. There, there never will be another birth like this one. This one stands alone. You see, Jesus had an earthly mother and a divine father. Jesus, though coming to the earth by way of Mary's womb, we have already learned that he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't, he didn't start in Mary's womb. He always was the eternal son of the eternal father. I want you to think for a minute that with this virgin birth, with Mary having never been touched by a man before and that the Holy Spirit had conceived in her womb and placed that seed of Jesus in the womb of Mary, I want you to think for a moment, because Jesus has the divine parentage of the Father, He's able to say in John 10.30, I and the Father are one. Because of this divine conception in the womb of Mary, Hebrews chapter 1 is able to start out in verse 3 saying, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Because of the virgin birth of Jesus, Paul was able to tell the Colossians in the opening verses, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. I want you to see to what links the Bible goes to make sure that we know that Joseph was not the father of Jesus, was not the, the biological father of Jesus. I told you that there were different genealogies in the Gospels. Luke's Gospel takes Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Adam. And Matthew takes Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Abraham, the father of the, Israel, of the nation of Israel. But I want you to go, look with me, flip your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, to, to our, our main text this morning, and look for just a moment at verse 16. Because amidst all this genealogy of so-and-so begets so-and-so, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, amidst all of that, there's something different. There's a format change in the genealogy of Jesus. In chapter 1, verse 16, it says, and Jacob, the father of Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Do you see what Matthew does? He wants to drive home to the audience that even though there was this genealogy in Joseph's life that went all the way back to David, and then all the way back to Abraham, even though he shows this genealogy, when he gets to Joseph, he doesn't say that Joseph beget Jesus. No, he says Joseph was the husband of Mary. He breaks the format. He changes it. He wants us to know Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus. There was a moment in John's gospel 
a pretty tense moment was arising. Jesus had shared some very difficult teachings with the religious leaders and, to be honest, some difficult teachings for his followers. In John chapter 6, he spoke about his blood being a drink and his flesh being bread to eat. And even some of his followers didn't understand what, what Jesus was saying. In fact, in John chapter 6, verse 66, a lot of the, a lot of the followers of Jesus left him because they, they couldn't understand it. But in John chapter 6, listen to this, Jesus is, his deity is being attacked. Jesus is saying that he is the bread of life, like the manna in the wilderness that came down from heaven. Jesus is saying, that's me. I'm like the manna. I'm the bread of heaven. One of Jesus' claims to be God. And I want you to hear the attack that the Pharisees place at Jesus when he claims to be God. In John chapter 6, verse 42, is not this Jesus, they say, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? When the enemies of Jesus are wanting to attack his claims of divinity, what do they do? One of their techniques here is to say, wait a second, Jesus. You're telling us you come down from heaven. You're telling us that you're God. You're telling us that your Father is the heavenly Father. You're making these great claims of deity. But Jesus, hang on a second. We know your mom and we know your dad. You were born of Joseph and Mary. In an attempt to, to refute his claims of divinity, they tried to associate his earthly biological father as Joseph. That was their chance. That was their attack. Jesus was born, number one, Jesus was conceived by the Spirit. We don't know how, but we know that the Spirit of God, whose work has always been creation and recreation, places within the womb of Mary the seed of God. Number two, Jesus was born into a scandal. He wasn't just conceived of the Spirit. He was born into a scandal. Scriptures allude to it. Joseph's really, really troubled. For us to understand what kind of a scandal this was and the magnitude of this scandal, we have to, under, we have to take ourselves out of our current culture and place ourselves in the culture in which these words were written. We need to understand something about matrimony in, among God's people and how it was perceived. Most of the marriages of this day were arranged. You didn't get much of a say. The, the, the woman was typically very young and the man was typically older, able to provide for a family. But the, 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 the relationship, the, 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 the union was really prearranged by others, usually parents. It was, in some instances, kind of like a business arrangement, really. But that kind of took some of the romance out of it, didn't it? Let me kind of let you in on a little secret. There wasn't a lot of romance. Well, Song of Solomon, never mind. So once this arrangement took place, they were not considered married until they were betrothed. And at that point, that was when they would be considered husband and wife, and yet they would not consummate the marriage. They were not allowed to have sex during that year. But they were considered husband and wife, but it was a time where they were to hold off from one another. That was an important year because even though they were considered husband and wife, they were to remain sexually pure. It was during this time of that one-year betrothal that Mary comes up pregnant. And the Bible is really clear. Joseph would have known exactly what the law said. That if a, if a woman who was betrothed to her husband comes up pregnant, it lies with a man. Deuteronomy chapter 22, it's all in there. They could actually be stoned, okay? So Joseph is now seeing Mary, and, and she's like, Joseph, i got to tell you, I'm, I'm pregnant, <laughs> Joseph is faced with this real dilemma. 
Now, I got to tell you, the Bible tells us that, that Joseph was a just man, a good man. And no doubt, Mary was favored by God. I have to believe that though they were not perfect, these were men and women of incredible moral integrity. And Joseph is now stuck with this, this issue. The woman that I'm betrothed to is pregnant. I can't believe that she would do that. She's a woman of such, such high moral integrity. I, I can't believe that, that this would have happened. So what does he do? Does he put her away? Does he say, hey, wait a second, you came up pregnant. You're the one that messed up. Now it says he's a just man. He doesn't want to embarrass her, so he's going to put her away quietly. He's going to divorce her quietly. That was the best, most gracious option he had. Because you know what his other option was? All right, Mary, I'm not even going to worry about it. I'm going to raise this kid like it's mine. You know what Joseph would be saying to all the population? Yeah, it's me. Joseph, in not putting her away, would have, in a sense, been owning up and saying, yep, it's me. Even though it wasn't, he would have been living a lie, in a sense. But what happens? God intervenes. God steps in. In the dream, what does God say to Joseph? Don't be afraid, Joseph. She didn't do this. Somebody else didn't do this. God says, I did it. This is all part of my big plan. What does, he t what does the angel tell Mary? Don't be afraid. Listen, guys. Here's the thing. We get in our minds sometimes as followers of Christ that following Jesus is always going to be this slightly downhill, wind at our back, sun in our face, birds chirping, flowers blooming journey. We do. And you know who perpetuates that sometimes? We do. Unintentionally, of course. We believe that following Jesus is the greatest thing. And, and I ask your forgiveness if I've ever given the impression that following Jesus is always a journey of roses because it's not. Oftentimes there are a lot of thorns. You know what happened? Let me ask you a question, guys. Can you think of any greater honor than for God to say, I want you to be the foster dad of my son. Can you think of any greater honor that God would have chosen you to raise his son who is the king of kings and lord of lords? I, I cannot think as a dad of any greater honor than to be the one chosen by God to be responsible for God's Son. Women, can you think of any greater honor than for God to say, I want you to be the earthly vessel that brings my Son into the world? Here's the point. Even though there were tremendous blessings, there was a great cost. No doubt, Joseph suffered. He takes his family to Bethlehem. Then he has to run down to Egypt for two years. All the while, the whispers and the murmurings. If you think I'm being too serious about this scandal, In John chapter 8, Jesus gets in a debate with the religious leaders. Jesus is saying, you are of your father, the devil. And Jesus said, I'm of my father, the father. It was the original, my dad can beat up your dad debate. And Jesus starts talking about his father. And you know what the religious leaders say to him? If you think I'm making too much of this being a scandal, 
Listen to what they say in John 8, 41. Jesus said, you are doing the works your father did, the devil. That's what he's saying. You are doing the works your father did. Listen to what they said to him. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Do you know what they said to Jesus? You were born of an illicit relationship. They were saying to Jesus, oh yeah, we know who our father is. We know what you guys did. We know what your mom and dad did. We know the scandal that came along with you. They said that about Jesus. If you think I'm making this into a bigger deal, I'm not. It's right there. That was an attack. They leveraged to Jesus. When you and I are called to follow Christ, listen, it is not always going to be slightly downhill with the wind at our back and the sun in our face and birds chirping and cheering us on. It's going to be hard and there's always that tension. Always that tension. The blessing versus the cost. It's always there. We read in the Word, what are we supposed to do? I'm supposed to love one another. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to forgive. What am I supposed to do? For as much as is within me to live at peace with one another. What am I supposed to do? Reconcile. What am I supposed to do? Confess and repent of my sins. What am I supposed to do as a follower when we read across those? We're tempted to say, wait a second. What's the cost? What's the cost in relationship to the blessing? Is it worth it? We do it all the time. It's the tension we're held in. Joseph was put in a very difficult situation. The scandal of Jesus' birth Joseph said, yeah, I'll do it. I will take Mary to be my wife, and I will not touch her until that baby is born, and I will raise him as my own. Joseph took on the ridicule and shame. Joseph weighed the same things we weigh, the blessing versus the cost, and said, the blessing is greater. I would rather walk in obedience to the Lord. It would be wrong for us to assume that the arrival of God's Son was without difficulty. It would be wrong also for us to assume that our journey with Christ is without difficulty as well. It will always cost us something. Listen, please. Discipleship is not following Jesus to the cross. Discipleship is following Jesus on the cross. That's discipleship. We want to stay down here. Following Jesus always costs us something. Hudson Taylor said, ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. Jesus has called us to weigh those, but to let that scale fall without the cost focused on the blessing. He was not just conceived of the Spirit. He was not just born into a scandal. Praise God. He was born to be our Savior. I got to tell you, the shadow of the cross was laid across that manger. It was dim. And they wouldn't have seen it. We see it. We're able to come back and look at this as a whole and see this beautiful picture. They weren't. I think Zechariah understood it. I think Zechariah saw a little of that shadow of the cross laying over the sun when he prophesied the coming of the Messiah. I think Simeon saw it in the temple. When he told Mary, yes, a sword shall pierce through your own soul also that the hearts of many shall be revealed. I think Simeon saw a little bit of a shadow of that cross. Here's what I want to tell you. In all of the Christmas story, in all of the Christmas season, it is not just that Jesus came. Something that we can easily forget is He came of His own accord. He did not come because He heard the cries of us saying, save us from our sins. Not at all. 
This wasn't God speaking to Moses saying, I've heard the cry of my people under the taskmaster's whip. No, we weren't crying because of our sins. We were rejoicing in our sins. We were loving being sheep without a shepherd. We were loving going our own way. We were fine being in the darkness. None of us were crying out to God saying, please come save us. No, He did not come as a response to our cries. He came as a response of our need. And here, I told you about Genesis chapter 3 the other day. In chapter 3, verse 15, Adam and Eve have sinned. They've eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin has passed down upon them. The process of death is beginning. You know what happens? They put on their, they, they sew together leaves and they go hide in the trees. You know why? They hear the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And instead of running to God, instead of fellowshipping with God, they run from God and they hide because they know they're naked, they're ashamed. Wow, look at what sin does. The creator and the pinnacle of his creation who once had perfect fellowship are now broken and divided and one's hiding from the other and ashamed. And he's hiding in the trees with his wife and you know what happens? The Bible says in chapter 3 verse 15 that the very first question God ever utters is this, Adam, where are you? Now, wait a second. This is Genesis, right? So God had to grow in his omniscience, right? He wasn't fully all-knowing at that point. No. He knew. He's always been omniscient. He's always known all things. Then why in the world would God come to the place where he knows Adam is and say, Adam, where are you? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me why he did it, but I can assume and I can assume that what we find in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is not just an instance where God is asking a question. I believe what we find in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is the entire theme of the Bible. It is what we find on every single page of God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. You see, God, I believe, said, Adam, where are you? For several reasons, one of which is He wanted Adam to know that he was worth looking for. He wanted Adam to know, I love you, Adam. I want you to know I'm looking for you. I want you to know that you have value. I want you to know that I want you back in this relationship. Adam, where are you? Here I am, God. Every page of the Bible, every plan, every promise of God is wrapped up in that question. Man is separated. Man has run. Man is on his own. And God is seeking to restore and redeem that which is lost. Jesus said, Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Christmas is the coming of the Messiah. Christmas is the birth of the only Son of God. But He came, not because I asked Him to, because he needed to. We love him because he first loved us. That's the magic of Christmas. That's the amazing message. God knew my need before I ever did. Jesus said in John 6, no one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that last day. Two things I want to ask you this morning. If you are a follower of Jesus, let me ask you this question. What do you know Christ is calling you to do right now? What do you know? Is it that worker, that co-worker that you work with that God has been calling you to pray for and to initiate a relationship with? Is it something in your, your marriage, something in your family that God is calling you to start or to stop? Something you're saying, something you're doing, something you're looking at that you know you shouldn't and God's calling you to do it. Are you willing today to say, God, I'm willing to look at the blessing over the cost. I'm willing to follow you no matter what. This morning, maybe it's about going or doing or being. Are you willing to say yes to God? Are you willing to take on a challenge knowing that God has called you to that? Maybe this morning... You've never trusted Christ. Maybe you've never made taken that first step towards Him. Friend, let me promise you, He's already taken the first step towards you. 
The ball is in your court. Is God prompting you? Is God working in your heart to, to, to show you your need of Him? And if you've never trusted Christ, you want to talk to somebody, I want to invite you. We'll have counselors down along the front. We'd love to be able to share with you the promise and the truth of Jesus Christ. Father, this morning, help us to consider the greatness of the birth of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that he came not as a result of our request, not as a result of our pleas, but as a result of our need. We pray, Father, that you would work. You'll continue your work of the Spirit in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.